Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 202, Budgeting for Board Gamers, Funding Your Board Game Hobby. I'm Sean, your host, and here with me live, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. Remember that we record live Wednesday nights at 8 p.m., note that new time, at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and you should come join us in the lobby, our chat room. Tonight, we are talking board game budgets and funding our board game hobby. We're going to be reviewing Court, a modern trick-taking and game and quest pyramid from Escape Well, as well as talking about the games we've been playing lately. Now, here's an apology for those of you here to hear about session zero for board gamers or session zero for board games. I am sorry to say that is not what we're going to be covering tonight. All week, I've been promoting this live show saying that's what we're going to be talking about. But just this morning, uh, not all that long ago, three, four hours ago, Deanna noted that we already covered this topic in detail in the past. Not even all that long ago. Um, I did go back through that episode and I got to say, we did a pretty good job on it, and there's no real need to revisit it at this time. While we remembered talking about Session Zero many times on the show, it was as parts of other topics and during AMAs. Both of us actually forgot that we already did a full episode yep. deep dive on this. I guess that's what happens when you get to 200 episodes. You start to forget some of the older ones. <laughs> so if you are here for Session Zero talk, I do apologize. But I strongly encourage you to check out the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 188. Session Zero is not just for RPGs. During all of our shows, we mention a lot of stuff. Games, podcasts, Kickstarters, publishers, past articles, old podcast episodes, and more. Find links to these things in our show notes, which you can find at tabletop tabletopbellhop.com slash episode 202. That's episode 202. Once this episode drops on Tuesday. With that, let's get started over at the Suggestion Box. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we share a small selection of feedback we've gotten on our content. Let's start off with an amusing but positive comment from Weird. I blame Mo for pretty much all the board games I now enjoy. Pretty much responsible for getting me into board gaming in general. Ah, uh, thanks, Weird. Well, I actually met him during a D&D 4E organized play event. I've really enjoyed gaming with him over the years, though I didn't really realize until this comment that it's totally my fault he's into board games as much as role-playing games now. It's also been awesome to see him out at public play events again, because it had been way too long since I gamed with Sean. Uh, actually, he used to be part of my old Monday night group we talked about in the first hundred episodes of this show. <laughs> Next up, a comment on our Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria review from Andrew Whipple III. Andrew says, Thanks for the review. I'll be curious to see what you think about the Rise of Titans modular expansions. As these were being developed, we thought that at least one, if not most, would be incorporated into every game. And I'm curious if you'll feel the same. Either way, I'm anticipating your thoughts. Hey, Andrew, thank you for the comment. Um, sorry. We haven't gotten around to trying any of the Shadow Kingdoms expansions. Uh, it was on our list to do, so I think we explained this during the Shadow Kingdoms review. We were gearing up to review the game. We did a preview, so you can check out our Kickstarter preview, and our thoughts on that still stand. It's a great game, great dice placement game. But the problem is it went out of print quickly, which is good for Daily Magic Games, but we didn't see the point in publishing a full review of the final game when no one could get it. So we waited for that to come out. So we kind of put the game on hold for a long time. And it was the same for the expansion. The expansion wasn't readily available. So I didn't see the point in reviewing it. But because of that, we haven't even used it. We just kept playing with the core rules. So this is on my list to get reviewed. And I keep needing to get to them. But I, we just get distracted, right? I had, uh, other games come out. A mix of new things we picked up. Other obligations. I do promise we'll get to them sometime, hopefully soon. Now, I did read the rules for each of these, and I've got to say one of my bigger complaints about that game is the lack of asymmetry, and I was pleased to see that some new asymmetric elements are added, though they're not actually based on the races. I still want each race to feel different. Well, let's finish off with a comment on our Smash Up Disney Edition review from Chris Groff. Solid review. I've always found Smash Up to be a game that I want to like because on the surface, it has a lot of the features I like in card games, but it's just clunky. 
the constant adding up of power is irritating. Hmm. We've used dice to track base power in the past, and that helps till someone bumps the table. I'm hmm. glad to see the additions of tokens to try and help, but still, the maths remain. There are other little niggling things I find in other sets I've tried, like the timing issues or card moves setting off chain reactions. Action paralysis is also a big mm -hmm. thing I find in this game and not something I normally suffer from. On one hand, I'm a bit surprised because this is a new base set and catering to Disney fans, all of which you noted in your review. So I yep. too would have just assumed this would be a more straightforward, good for the family ver version. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, though, even though I'm not interested, I'm glad that a Disney label on a game doesn't mean watered down. Well, thanks for that uh, extensive comment, Chris. I'm sorry to hear the game's not for you, but glad we can make you aware of that. Not every game is for everyone, and that's a very good thing in our opinion. In regards to the Disney name on games, we talked about that a lot last week during our Sorcerer's Arena review. Anymore, seeing Disney on a game honestly doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean you're looking at a kid's game or a simpler version of a big game. And I think we're at the point now that seeing Disney doesn't tell you anything except the game's going to have Disney characters in it. It says nothing about the game weight or complexity. It's now on people to do some research before buying, which I think is probably a good thing for game reviewers like us. Well, I think that's good enough for now. Remember, even if we don't read your comment out on air, we do greatly appreciate any and all mm -hmm. feedback and conversations that come out of your replies. Now, I think I, it's time to remind everyone that the big thing we've been promoting for weeks is in the announcements. Our huge 200th episode celebration giveaway is going strong. Yeah, only three days in, it became our most popular giveaway ever with the most entries we'd ever seen. I'm not counting the one that went up to like 100,000K entries because of bots. Legit entries. And as of the start of this week, I didn't check today. I don't know where we're at, but as of Monday, we we're at over 1,800 entries, which is awesome. We're not really surprised, though, as thanks to our 12 awesome sponsors, we're giving away a huge amount mm -hmm. of stuff with 39 prizes to be won, including some of the best games we've ever reviewed. Yeah, these include games like the Adventure Adventure Card Game from Ulysses Spiel. Land vs. Sea from, and Guildmaster from Good Games Publishing, two holiday hijinks games from Grand Gamers Guild, and Blackbrim 1876 from Puzzling Pursuits. To enter, head over to https at colon slash slash tabletopbellhop.com slash giveaway. Check out the full list of sponsors and games up for grabs, along with all of the other contest details. A big thank you to all of our sponsors. AEG, Escape Welt, Free League Publishing, Good Games Publishing, Grand Gamers Guild, Hidden Games, uh, Hidden Games International, Japan Made Games, The Op, Puzzling Pursuits, Rebel Studio, Ulysses Spiel, and Unidragon. That's it for the announcements this week. It's time to answer one of your questions and let you ask the bellhop. We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working, to make, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question comes from Troy Davis, who asks, My question is, how do you fund your board gaming hobby? Do you have a monthly budget you give yourself, or perhaps do you sell games to buy new ones? What is your strategy to prevent this hobby from destroying your <laughs> wallet? Thank you for the question, Troy. This is a great topic and I think an important one. While board games and other tabletop games are fun, uh, everyone needs to realize these are luxury items. These are not needs or necessities. You need to be treated as luxury items. There, you, you Collecting games can be dangerous in a way. Um, for one, it's easy to get caught up in the mix of having to have the new hotness. Second, if there are other board gamers around, or if you're on the internet anywhere and listen to podcasts, there's always trying to keep up with the Joneses, trying to make sure who has the biggest game collection. Oh, I got to have the new hot. Oh, if you pick this up yet? No, I've got it. That's part of it. You can spend too much very easily. Plus, there is an addictive nature to it, just like any other collection. Once you go past just buying games you play, you get into collecting games. Got to have them all. Every promo, buying games off eBay, getting out of print games. 
all of that can be a bit of a slippery slope. The important thing is you don't need that new game. No matter what it is, you don't need it. No matter how much you want it, you don't need it. No one needs to buy a board game. You definitely don't need every kind of superhero RPG ever published. Yes, now, if you exactly. Really, if you really need to game, there are many free options out there, from yes. print and plays to making use of items and components you already have on hand. The big thing when buying games, all right? You figure it out. You're, you're going to do it. You, you don't need it, but you want it bad enough. You're going to go buying it. The thing is you have to make sure that your board game hobby, uh, both buying and the time you spent playing and the time you spent doing it, should never be at the expense of other important things. Uh, food, rent, paying the bills being probably the most basic that people tend to, um, to skimp on in order to pay for these things. Those are the big ones. But also other things, right? Like spending time with your kids. Um, if you're one of those people like, oh, sorry, I can't buy you the new Zelda game, kids, because I bought you this cool mini or not thing, you might want to look at your priorities there. Clothing. Um, I'll admit, I wear a lot of the same clothes, but my kids need new clothes a little more often than I do and pants. But also time, like family events, right? When if you're you're skipping Easter because you got to go play on game night, or even just getting out of the house and spending money on other recreations like vacations. Just like you need a work life balance, you also need a game life balance. The key is, as with most things in life, spending within your means. If you're making minimum wage you're probably not regularly eating prime rib. Similarly, you probably shouldn't regularly be going all in on that new hot mini game on Kickstarter. Exactly. No, totally it. Now, one thing I do hate to see, and I want to call this out because this has not gone away, and I wish it would. This is, is a, 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 an old meme, an old joke that I wish would go away, is people joking about hiding how much they spend. Hiding the don't tell my wife I bought these games or how to hide it. Now, even worse are the people actually doing this, not just tongue in cheek laughing about it online. This could be hiding it from family, from significant others, from your friends, or even yourselves trying to trick yourselves into, well, I'm going to open it from shrink, put it on my shelf, and then it's, it's in the collection already. There's not a pile sitting waiting to go through. Or, you know what, I'm just not going to look at the bank account this month, or I'm not going to... I don't want to add up how much I spent on Kickstarter this month. I just know I backed a lot, right? If you ever find yourself lying about buying games or how much you spent or hiding the amount you bought or own, that is a problem. Now, I'm sure there's a technical term for this type of retail therapy and the hoarding that goes along with it, but I'm no psychologist. I don't want to try to pigeonhole this, but realize this can be a problem. Now, one term that definitely applies in, in the case of relationships anyway is financial infidelity. Yeah. If you are lying to your family and partners about finances and how much is spent, it is financial infidelity. And frankly, you should reach out and talk to someone about it. Yeah. So, yes, you need to watch what you're buying and how much you're spending. You should have some form of budget. Not necessarily a formalized line in your household budget or in your QuickBooks or whatever. But it's got to be something you at least think about and consider. You need to at least be aware of how much you're spending and where the money's coming from and where else it could be going. Now, sadly, the education system, or at least the one I went through, fails pretty seriously mm -hmm. on any sort of financial intelligence. I learned how to balance the books of a business, but was expected to just somehow know how a household budget works or how to do your own taxes. Now, I will say my girls have taken some of this. There's a civics course that is mandatory requirement that does cover, excuse me, that does cover at least like paying rents and mortgages and some of this. So it's more than we had, but it's, I'm sure it's still not enough. Now, as for how big this budget should be, that I can't tell you. I really can't. Everyone's situation is completely different. Your income, your amount of spending money, how deep you are into the hobby, how often you feel the need for a new experience. How often you're willing to play the games you have over and over, how often you play, all of these are all factors. What I would say, though, as a rule of thumb, start low, like, I don't know, one game every three months. And then if you find you want more and can afford more and they fit into the budget, you can up it. If you've got the money, 
go nuts. Buy a game a day if you want. So I got to say that gets into the hoarding thing and you want to make sure you can actually play the games you're doing. Being a board game collector, while it seems kind of cool, I think is generally for most people an excuse. Yes, my hoard looks great, but Bellhop's first rule, the games, the best games in your collection are the ones that hit your table. Try not to outpace it. But if you don't have the money, don't spend it. And even you can start off just by pick a game you want and save money until you can afford that game. And then pick another game and save until you can afford it. Exactly. So those are kind of some generalizations. Yes, you should have a budget. Go, go ahead and buy games. We're not saying you shouldn't, but realize they're luxury items and make sure it's not at the expense of something actually more important. And yes, sometimes it takes a hard look to sit down and divide those two up is what's important because leisure activities are important. Gaming is important. Their social activities are important. You shouldn't just say, no, they're not important, but you got to put it up against things like feeding your family, eating healthy, getting exercise, and all the other important parts of life. Absolutely. All right, moving away from the generalizations, let's talk about how I personally handle my board game spending. Now, for this, I'm going to rewind the clock. I'm going to use the time stone and twist it because... Uh, as I'm sure most listeners are aware, a lot of my new games now come from this whole tabletop bellhop thing. That wasn't always the case. Even when I was blogging with the Windsor Gaming Resource and I posted stuff over at Medium, review copies were very few and far between. And the only thing I ever got sent were indie games, indie small publisher, single produce games. It's not like I ever got anything from a big game company. And I've also had to assume that most people out there listening to this aren't doing this as a, as a living. I know very few people are, but even as a side hobby. So I want to talk about how I grew my collection to be as big as it is before I became the tabletop bellhop. Because I got to say it was pretty big before we decided to do this professionally. The answer, become a well-respected game reviewer or journalist, is simply not really a feasible solution to avoid budgeting for your mm -hmm. games. It's sort of like deciding to become a professional photographer so that you can go see pro football games on the sidelines. Sure, yeah. it's possible, but it's really unlikely that you're going to be the one who gets that chance. Yeah. The only reason I do this, Jim, is to get to see the game. I don't know if there's anyone out there. So my early collection um, honestly started by having gamer parents. Obviously, this is something you can't do about now. Like, oh, I should have had better parents. Uh, you may feel that way, but this is something I want to call out only because if you are currently a parent or planning to be a parent, you want to think about this as something you can do for your kids. You can start your kids off right by letting them have their own games and picking out games themselves. Now, no, their own games, not just letting them play your collection and play with your toys. Let them have their own toys and have their own joy of collecting. My kids have their own board game bookshelf where they keep their games on it that they play together and sometimes play with us. I think the important thing here is, is get them into it and let them pick the games, even if they sometimes sound terrible. Though, to be fair, my collection still to this day, in fact, is largely made up by the games I played as a child with my family, mm -hmm. uh, games that were handed down to me from my parents uh, to become the beginnings of my collection. Yeah. Uh, next up for me was saving money where I could to buy the things, gaming things I wanted. Like I got a set amount of money for lunch in high school. You get whatever it was. I don't remember. You get so much a day or so much a week. And what I would do is I would try to save a buck a day by not buying add-on. I didn't buy the cookies. And trust me, if you went to Brendan, you wanted the cookies. They have the most fantastic cookies. So I wouldn't buy the cookies or I'd skip the chocolate milk or I not order the extra set of fries or whatever it happened to be in order to save up money to buy gaming stuff. Now, at that time for me, it was Warhammer miniatures. And in general, it took me two weeks to buy another pack of orcs or goblins or whatever miniature I wanted at the time. And that worked for me. Now, the thing is, though, this still applies, though it was something I did in high school. There is no reason anyone can't still purchase games that way. Just basically create some board game savings. Now, I say savings, I'm not saying you need a savings account, though maybe that's the way you do it. It could just be a physical jar you drop money into, and you toss in your spare money. Heck, make a swear jar at your game night, and every time someone swears, they, they put a buck in or something, and then the next time, the group gets a new game. 
you're going to save a bit week by week until you can afford the game you want. For more modern, not kids in high school, maybe you skip the Timmy's once a week or you order the small instead of the large or you make sure to clip some coupons for groceries or shop at multiple stores, even though it's a bit more work. Cut the grass yourself instead of paying the neighbor's kid or whatever you can do to scrimp and save stuff that's already in your budget, just spending less on it so that you now have some money to put towards gaming. Heck, if you're a Starbucks addict, you could skip like two drinks and have a board game. <laughs> Well, <laughs> very much true, I'm sure. Uh, you, don't, you don't need the uh, rainbow frappuccino every day. There you go. Nice and easy. That's all you do. Cut back on the caffeine as I pound a coffee here. Now, looking back at actual budget line items, you can also make your gaming budget be the amount you're under budget somewhere else. So kind of like the scrimp and save, like if you have whatever tim hortons honestly if you do go every day should be a line item on your family budget well the money you don't spend on tim's that week or starbucks or whatever it happens to be could then carry over right like when you're doing your end of month finances everyone does end of month finances don't they uh, you carry that over whatever money you saved in the one category goes into the gaming copy which is one way you can do it the thing is just don't overdo it right like don't take too much away for gaming like, for example, I didn't stop eating lunch at school. I still got the core lunch. I got the burger, the pizza, the egg salad or whatever for lunch. It was the extra bits, you know, the cookies, the for some reason, everyone was obsessed with Mentos at that time. You skip the Mentos and still eat the burger. Now, start early and don't be ashamed to start small. Yeah. If you can only find a dollar a week, great, do it. It might take a little longer, but it might also make you think harder on what you will buy when you have the funds and appreciate having it that much more. Now getting into to being a full on adult and all the responsibilities that come with it, um, it's going to sound pretentious and it's definitely a position of privilege and it's not always fair, but the best way you can afford games is make lots of money. Uh, have a good job that pays well. This is honestly where the majority of my games come from. I worked in the auto industry. I was middle management level for years, and it paid rather well. Well enough that we could afford all the bills and all of, all the, the, the expenses and the rent and everything we needed and still have spending money left over every paycheck. Board gaming can be an expensive hobby, and due to that, the more money you have, the more you can spend and the bigger your collection can be. And this isn't something to be ashamed of. It's just the, the fact of the world. The money makes the world go round. If you have more money, you can buy more things. And now I see it's it's in 2023, it seems more true than ever because there are a lot of now high-end luxury games coming out catering to the people who have this money. You got deluxe editions, you got foil cards, you've got miniature versions, you've got $1,000 opening bid Kickstarters and ultra uber deluxe editions. Yeah, again, gaming is a luxury. And while we all deserve some level of luxury and comfort, there's a huge chasm between having a deck of cards that you can sit back and play with over a beer and the latest big box from Simon. Yeah. Now, for me, eventually we had kids. Uh, inflation's a thing. Costs kept going up. Uh, promotions for me stopped due to the glass ceiling at work. Once you're middle management, it's sometimes hard to get to that next level. Um, and raises got fewer and farther between. And I found even my good job wasn't cutting it. And those savings diminished. Board games honestly weren't on the budget anymore. We got to that point where there were more important things that we had to pay for first. And I had to find a new way to keep up with the hobby because it was something I loved and it was a big part of who I am. And this is where I started applying what I call the gaming pays for gaming method. The only money I spent on games came from games in some way. Now, a big part of this was selling games. I no longer played and trying to get the best price for them. Now, I don't want to get into details on how to do that here, but if you check out the how to make the most of your unwanted tabletop games article over at tabletopbellhop.com or listen to episode 99 of our podcast titled for sale. We do go into detail on getting the most for your existing game collection or games you no longer want. So if you have managed to assemble a collection, it can be a great way to stretch your funds. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're not able to save much, but along with the sale of an old board game, you don't find yourself playing anymore you might be able to get more than you otherwise would have thought. Yeah, and I've mentioned on the show before, but there's a group of my friends that when they get a game, they do everything they can to improve that game. 
oblinging it out, making it look better, and then sell that to buy their next game. And so far, they've managed to not have to spend money. Like, they just keep rotating this big game to this next big game. And that's how they afford those giant Kickstarters, is they play them long enough and then sell them to someone who missed out on the giant Kickstarter to get another giant Kickstarter. Now, eventually this wasn't up, right? I ran out of the things to sell, or I wasn't making much on the used stuff, or it was just more work. So what I dove into were self- affiliate sales. Now, I want to point this out right away, and not because I don't want the competition, but doing affiliate sales is a lot of work for very, very little return on the time spent. When I started doing this, I would literally make cents a week in Canadian cents. And then only after getting the word out all over the place and growing a following over years, did that get up to a few bucks a month. And I mean that a few bucks a month. That's it. Back then, affiliate sales generally meant I could get a new game every two to three months. And what I would do is I would save up credit so that I would wait for a big sale. So I would wait for the buy two, get one free sale and suddenly get three new games at once. And that was it. That's how I bought games, honestly, for a few years. And on top of that difficulty with affiliate, there is a lot of competition for affiliate Mm -hmm. sales. Every article you see in your board game newsfeed is almost certainly using affiliate links. A lot of the links on board game geek will be affiliate links. So finding a way to get people to click on your links and not one of the other thousand affiliate links is tough. Yeah. Board game geek did it right. It's actually automated. Every link is an affiliate link on Board Game Geek, and it's automated by their system. So if you click on any of those, you, you are you are helping out Board Game Geek, which all the power to them. I'm not trying to say affiliate sales are bad. Like, it is part of how we do things around here. But yes, and, and my only thing is every article you see, I really, it, they should be disclosing they use affiliate links. You will note on all of our content, we clearly state if we are using affiliate links. Now, of course, years later, after many hours of work, we do pretty good with the tabletop gaming deals side of the business, but it's still not enough to pay our basic bills or anything like that, or even get me a game a week. That said, the gaming for paying for gaming thing is still true to this day. So at this point, for me, gaming actually pays for more than new games for us. But sadly, we're also aware that this can potentially go away in a heartbeat. There have been plenty of stores who have just said, nope, no affiliate earnings on games. Mm -hmm. Now, thankfully, many of them have also learned their lesson and come crawling back. But the risk exists and is real. Now, as noted earlier, most of my new collection, my newer collection, the games I'm playing lately and picking up lately do come from publishers in the form of review copies of games. I get a few games every year as gifts as well, and I do buy the occasional game myself as well. And I'm obviously not the only one doing this, right? There are a ton of board game reviewers out there that I'm sure are in the same boat, and this could be a viable way for you to grow your collection. But again, realize there's a lot of work that goes into being a reviewer, and I do not think it is profitable to review games to get free games. I I do not think that is actually a viable option. You have to want to share your love of games. You have to like writing or YouTubing or vlogging or whatever case you're using to get them across. It's just not a a, a free game is not much payment when compared to the amount of work that goes into preparing and publishing a review. We play each game five times a minimum of these times we've talked about many times. We post an unboxing, a review on the podcast and on the blog as well as taking pictures both during gaming and as specific setups and editing down a separate review from the podcast uh, and having discussions with publishers both before and Mm -hmm. after the product arrives and we deliver our reviews. It's not out of the ordinary for a $40 MSRP game to eat up 40 hours of effort. Yeah. And that's not a great. No, (laughs) I I don't know many places in the world that don't have better than a one hour, one, one dollar per hour minimum wage. Though said that said, it could be a viable way to grow your collection. I just realized it's not this simple, easy thing of all I have to do is ask some publishers and they'll start sending me games. Let's go. So that's how I have managed to stay invested in the board game hobby without breaking the bank. 
at this point, we're assuming you have a budget. You got to have some kind of budget. Again, it doesn't not necessarily even a dollar amount. Even if your budget is I spend everything extra I have, that works. Let's get to some tips on keeping the hobby as affordable as possible and staying under that budget you've set for yourself. Because you did set a budget, right? Yeah. Right? So my first one's pretty simple. It is buy used. Um, buy used games. They're cheaper than new games. You don't need to ding and dent also falls in here. Companies have sales on used games. Your local game store may sell used games. There are fantastic, at least locally, and I assume because it's in Windsor and we're not that big, they're everywhere. Buy and sell groups on Facebook selling games. We actually have three good groups here in Windsor for buying and selling board games, which is pretty awesome. Um, there's Discord channels and so on. Don't pay full price. Uh, try to find used copies. If they're in good shape, you get to know the sellers. Um, I will also recommend Board Game Geeks Geek Market um, for that because Board Game Geek users are alpha gamers. They're the people who took the time to make a Board Game Geek account, and they're taking the time to list their game there. In general, they care a bit more than the average person. And compared to buying a game on the Facebook Marketplace, everything I bought there was not only in excellent condition, but tended to be blinged out in some way. So every game I bought showed up and all of a sudden, like all the components are in Plano or there's like, so they went out and bought stickers and put them on the meeples and stuff. I have been extremely impressed. Now, as usual, buyer beware. Um, you are, it is a marketplace, but they like said board game geek self moderates itself really well. And I have no worries buying that. Yeah. Now, one question you should really ask yourself though, is do you need to own the games you play? Uh, there are a lot of ways that you can enjoy and play and, and, and delve into the board gaming hobby without heavily investing in mm -hmm. a game library of thousands of games yourself. Right. Uh, one of the primary events that we talk about on a regular basis, and Mo is, is a, a major host of in Windsor, is public play events. I'd go out. Most public play events, I've yet to be be at one where there weren't games to play. That they, they fully expected all of the games to be provided by the people showing up. I don't even know if that type of thing even exists. Someone is providing games at those events. It's a great place to try out and play other people's games, which actually leads to another point about saving money is make sure you are going to like the games you play which is uh, something that falls under a few categories here, but public play events are a great way to do this is go out and try the game. That way you're not buying a game that it ends up. You don't like you're making sure to spend your money more effectively. Now, another, um, another great way to, to sort of test this out in advance, uh, assuming you have one in your area and judging by what I've seen, there aren't too many sized cities anymore that don't have a board game cafe of some sort. Yep. where you can pay and uh, enjoy some coffee and some board gaming time. Uh, and sure, maybe that'll eat a little bit into your board game budget, but it might be worth it if you get to know that you are going to uh, enjoy that game. Yeah, even better with most board game cafes, I will not say all of them, is most have teachers there that will teach you the games, which is sometimes better than picking something up for yourself and having to learn it. So personally, I think that $5 fee per table probably offsets the cost of having someone else teach me how to play something as well. If you've got a big enough city or you're willing to travel a little bit, there are cons all over mm -hmm. North America and the world where you can go. And almost always these days, many of these cons are going to have some form of board game library or free to play mm -hmm. area or other people who have just brought their board games to introduce them to other people. Uh, cons are a great way to find out this as yep. well as getting demos from publishers. Another thing to watch for at cons are deals, used games, ding and dent. Publishers love to go to cons. If you go to origins, you have to hit the cool stuff, Inc booth and check out their ding and dent. Cause remember these are luxury items and their games you're supposed to be having fun with. They're not pots of gold. If there's a little dent in your copy of Gloomhaven, you're able to pick it up for 50 instead of 150. Who cares about that ding in the box? Absolutely. Uh, cons also provide, sorry, cons also provide a place for publishers to promote their games. And I have learned about so many great games that I've then gone on to purchase through demos. Demos is something special. In general, a publisher running a demo event has set up a special version of the game. 
a shorter version with certain rules in play or not in play to really highlight the best parts of the games. And they are a great way to experience lots of games in a short amount of time. Most real games or whatever, full games are going to take, you know, two to four hours, depending on the game, where most demos are 10 minutes. So I can try six demo games in the same amount of time I can play one ticketed con game. And that is a great way to learn about new games, at least to do that first initial, do I care? Do I want to learn more? Yeah, be aware that these demo games are obviously set up to show off the games yes. in their best light. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not going to give you that full experience where you discover, oh, well, this one particular part of the game I don't enjoy. But yep. they'll give you a good idea for the general theme and feel of the game, uh, which may be enough to push you to find out more. Yep. Another great way is digitally. Yes. Uh, between Board Game Arena and all of the other online board gaming sites out there nowadays, especially, uh, I hate to say it, thanks to the pandemic, they, a lot of them grew yes. uh, and became uh, more, more popular and uh, better ways to play online games, whether to play be so that you don't buy or to play so that you can learn whether you would like to buy. Yeah, and that includes also uh, Tabletop Simulator, Tabletopia, and all the other virtual tabletops as well, and Steam versions of games. Steam has fantastic sales, as everyone knows. Um, we've now fallen in love with Humble Bundle as, or sorry, yeah, yeah Humble Bundle, not Bundle of Holding, Humble. Humble puts games on sale all the time, way cheaper than their physical version. Plus, the digital versions are generally cheaper than the full game anyway. Like the digital version of Terraforming Mars, I think is 30 bucks, whereas the full box is 60. There are also a number of mobile versions of a lot of these games uh, mm -hmm. as well. Uh, and mobile games are often going on discount. Now, another one that's come up, and I have not tested this myself in Windsor, so bad on me. But I see a number of people talking about taking out games at their libraries including um, events at the libraries that they can play. But not only that, like just games on the shelves where you show your library card or your library app in most cases nowadays, and then you get to take the game home and you get it for a week and you have to return it back, just like getting a book. And I have seen a number of people talking about the games they've been playing from their local libraries. It's a bad on me for never checking to see if the local library has anything like that. Should probably get more involved with them. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Uh, and then... Once you've either decided you want to buy a game or have figured out, you know, played a demo, learned the experience, played it enough on Board Game Arena that you just really need to have your own copy, look for sales. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a lot of sales out there. And if you are on a tight budget, uh, there are both sales both at your friendly local gaming store so you can support local. But also we understand that sometimes... You just don't have the money to spend at the friendly local store. Yeah. And as much as you'd like to support them, your budget doesn't allow it. And online stores may be the solution. Yeah. And in that case, I got a, a little bit of self-promotion. You can follow tabletop underscore deals on Twitter or good geek deals group on Facebook or now tabletop gaming deals. All one word on Dice Camp for those of you who have fled those other social media sites, which I fully understand. Um, that's, that's, I share sales on online deals. And yes, most of the links are affiliate links, but not all of them. We share any good deals we find. Um, but yes, I, it makes sense, right? Like if you can't, if you can afford it, please support your local game store. If you can't afford it, please do something else to support your local game store, especially if you play there. Yeah. Promote them, share them, tell your friends about it, use their resources, buy what you can buy. Like if you can't afford all the D and D books, you can at least buy your dice at your local game store. For example, absolutely. Uh, now, and, on, go ahead. Uh, the <laughs> other there, once you're there, as well as things, there are Facebook groups, especially localized groups. Yep. Uh, and this actually gets into localized groups on Board Game Geek as well. Sure. Uh, but game find groups on whatever your preferred online social media site is that are other gamers in your area. There may be ways to ask games around and trade and and cooperate with each other to expand your library without actually buying mm -hmm. but making use of other board game resources already there in your area 
Yeah, there's a, again, there's some great Facebook groups for here for selling games. What I don't see a group for is trading games, but there are a number of small like board game groups and RPG groups and D&D groups and sometimes groups for specific games, miniature gamer groups, where is a great place to trade, sell your old games. Um, the local miniature gamers seem to pass their stuff around a lot, I've noticed. Um, even local game stores sometimes have uh, Facebook groups as well. I will call out Solon's Tabletop Renaissance Group. If you are looking to get a miniature, you know, or you're 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 looking to get something painted, that's the place to go. Um, trading games is great. However, you do it. We used to run um, RPG book exchanges where we let people get rid of the stuff they're no longer using to get new stuff, and that's always gone well. But I gotta say, the ultimate way to trade games, um, though it's a bit of a mess to get into, but once you figure it out, are math trades. These are a thing where there's there's math, uh, an algorithm in the background that basically everyone puts in all the games they want. They put in all the games they have to trade, and then it does all the math for you. So it might be that I give a game to Sean. Sean gives a game to Deanna. Deanna gives a game to uh, Tech, and Tech gives a game to Sean, and then Sean gives a game to me. And in the end, we're all happy, and we all got what we wanted without any of us actually knowing each other, like interacting ahead of time no deals made no there's no bartering there's no wall that's not worth it it does all the work for you yeah absolutely math trades again they're really hard to organize but if you can find an established uh organization a group that does math trades uh where someone who is familiar with the system and the uh the algorithms behind it is organizing mm -hmm. it you can really make get a great uh, return on value or not return on value but uh, a great benefit from getting rid of the games you no longer want and finding some new to you versions and this is another one for cons breakout con happened this last weekend they had a huge what they call it bring and sell bring and buy it was either bring and buy or bring and sell room where people brought in games at the start of the con and there was basically this massive dealer room with i think it might have got to tens of thousands of games. Like, it was just a ridiculous number of games all lined up there. The seller set the price. I don't even know exactly how it all worked, but like, oh, there, there was so much stuff there. Like, what a great way, because again, it's impersonal. You don't have to be there. You just, you know, you go through the process, they take your game, they slap a price on it, and then people going through pay for it like they were shopping, right? They're like, I'll take this, this, and this. Go up to the breakout people, the breakout people pay you out. And then at the end of the con, you get whatever money you were owed for the people who bought your games. Absolutely. Uh, another great option is we talked about it in a negative format earlier, yeah. but there is a positive side to Kickstarters. Uh, some Kickstarters offer significant discounts if you're willing to pay in advance and wait uh, over buying that same game in, at retail. Yeah, you also often get promos and things like that that are worth it. And I will throw in one bonus tip. Um, you can often pay for a Kickstarter by not holding on to that bonus stuff because there will be people with it, assuming it's a big enough Kickstarter, who feel they missed out, with, whose FOMO will be strong and will pay you for, you know, that neoprene mat as much as it might have cost you for that entire Kickstarter. I, I happen to know that one from experience. So speaking of a specific Kuhlman or not game. Just be aware, though, that if you're looking for that uh, retail therapy buzz, that feel of, you know, oh, I got a new game and it feels great. The the time shift involved in Kickstarter yes. can often really sort of suck all the air out of that uh, mm -hmm. as as you can in certain, you know, basketball type games wait years to see that game finally arrive after you've paid. Or you could get nothing for your money, which has happened to me in the past. Absolutely. And then we were saying Kickstarter. By that, we mean all crowdfunding. I got to stop using Kickstarter as a, like as Kleenex. It's a Xerox. <laughs> Kickstarter has become Xerox. It's I know, <laughs> but it's still we shouldn't be. We should. Called, we, we should be saying game found Kickstarter. Crowdfunding game on our sources. Crowdfunding. Yes, crowdfunding. Now, what a lot of crowdfunding has become is a pre-order system. What you should look into, though, is pre-order systems from publishers. There are a number of them doing this now. Uh, Stonemaier Games is one of the more recent I've seen that stepped up doing it. There are a couple others. And what they tend to do, uh, the biggest example is the P500 system from GMT Games. Every GMT game ever published and will ever be published goes through this. If it's a brand new game, it's like, okay, we're thinking of making this brand new game. Here it is. 
if 500 people order this, if 500 people sign up now to buy it, we'll do a full print run, whatever that is, 5,000 copies, say. I don't know what their print runs usually are. If it doesn't hit 500, we don't make it. So in a way, it's a bit crowdfunding, but it's really a pre-order. But what they do to encourage people is they give them a significant discount for being part of the P500 program. Now, other companies are kind of mirroring this, but what they're doing is they're giving either discounts, but what I'm seeing more often is the first expansion free or some promo card or some little extra thing for helping to pre-order it. And I'm seeing this from companies who are moving away from Kickstarter. So it's kind of an evolution of a pre-order system, the Kickstarter stretch goals, switching over to publishers going, why am I using a third party? I can do this myself. Well, I think one of the largest ones would be Hasbro's. Yeah, pulse. System. pulse hasbro pulse uh oh. the next one is uh enter a giveaway like we got a really big 200th episode giveaway with 19 gaming prizes in it all games we strongly recommend uh though i'll admit i haven't played the one from grand gamers guild yet we have not played their holiday hijinks but all the rest of them we we've played reviewed and enjoyed what better way to get games instead of just you know supporting your favorite content creators, your favorite publishers, and uh, possibly getting the game free. And Sorry, 39, 39 prizes. 39 prizes. Uh, yeah, so another option, and this is one that we ta- that got talked up a little bit in our Discord earlier, is shared group libraries. Uh, mm-hmm. You don't need to buy the game, if, especially if you're not the only one who's going to be playing it. If you have a gaming group, the costs of that game can be spread out amongst the group. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you have, uh, you know, five people who always get together every Wednesday night and play board games, you can look at splitting that game five ways yep. in cost, and everyone essentially group owns that board game. Now, another way to do it, too, that makes it so that you're not necessarily arguing if someone leads the group who gets to keep it, is rotate who buys the games. You got five people. I buy one game, then Sean buys a game, then D buys a game. We each have our personal collection, but we play them with the group. And I'm going to call out something from the chat. I know we don't usually interrupt this section of the podcast for the chat, but um, Chicken Barf, welcome to the show. First time chatter called out the problem they've had with P500 is the GMT games have a ton of errata. And so it kind of sucks buying them first. You get that first printing. And I've got to say, I kind of see it because most GMT games tend to hit their stride around the fourth printing. So, yes, I can see that. But I guess, like, again, if, if the only way you can afford the new um, post-apocalyptic Thunder Road game is to back it at P500, then you just got to keep up with the errata online. And yeah. that's better than not being able to have the game. It's not like the Kickstarters we we all like love to back. And game found games don't have the same sort of problems. So it's it's far from a unique to P500 issue. Which uh, Angie Games replied that it also sucks when your paid copies are beta testers. And I got to say, here's another way. You can play test games. Publishers are always looking for play testers. It's surprisingly easy to get in as a play tester on various games. Now, I will say nowadays, most publishers are are, are saving money by using digital tools to play the games. They tend to use Tabletop Simulator or um, Tabletopia or something like that nowadays, which just makes sense because then you can play test your game all over the world without having to ship anything. But if you really want to be on the cutting edge, it's surprisingly easy to play test games. Way easier than, say, getting review copies. Absolutely. And many times it's as simple as joining a Discord and paying attention to uh, yep. announcements. But one thing that really helps keep the budget down, that really is you know, so one of the cheapest solutions out there is play the games that you already own. Yep. Again, you don't need that new game. Think of the one you just bought, the one you saved up a buck a week 10 years ago when you didn't have such a good job and you finally got it and you were so happy to bring it home. Maybe you dust that off and play it again. I've got games behind me from the 70s that still get played. Because they're fun. Yep. There's no reason that you have to play the brand new, shiny, big box game from this or that company. There's a lot of games out there already <laughs> that you know, probably have. Uh, and I mean, worst case, get a deck of cards and pick up a, pick up a copy of Hoyle 
And yeah. uh, there's a few hundred games you own right then and there. You go to the Tabletop Bellhop blog. We've got an entire article with over 100 RPGs you can play with a standard deck of cards. Note, not all of those are free, but some are. Uh, or go to the Tabletop Bellhop and look at the free print and plays yes. listing. Where for the cop for the uh, price of a little bit of ink and paper, you may have a whole new board game that you love. Yeah, I think we've got over three hundred games on that particular list. Games or expansions, or some, some expansions for games. Um, the next one, I I realize this one this one's a little busy and does upset some people, but you know what? You do what you got to do is make money from your collection. There is people out there who rent their games, like rent them to other people to use them. There are people who will go to a stranger's house and run a game night for them for a fee. Uh, usually not an insignificant one. You could run events at the Finley local game store, maybe in exchange for games or store credit. You can host a board game tournament in your local area and keep a portion of the entry fees to compensate yourself for your time and for any wear and tear on your games. There are ways to monetize your board game collection, and there's nothing wrong with doing this. I realize people seem to think a hobby means you can't make money on it. I gonna make you ding the bell and say that's bullshit. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a reason, you know, people are going out there and DMing games for money. Well, there's really very little difference between the effort involved in setting up uh, and building a scenario and, pl and playing that with a group of people or taking a significant, you know, Euro game and teaching it and, and helping a group of player, mm -hmm. players play that game. Uh, there's very little difference indeed. Uh, and so why yeah. one should be accepted while the other isn't is beyond me. Though I got to say the paid DMing isn't accepted by a large group of people either. But pay people for their time effort. That mm -hmm. just should be something the world needs to start doing better at. Um. So another thing is look for free games other places. Like we called it a couple places you can go on our website, but there are a number of free games out there. Uh, if you go to the one bookshelf set of sites, like there's a ton of these, there's war game vault for you, war gamers, there's drive through RPG for the RPG players, there's drive through cards. There's um, specific sites for savage worlds and pathfinder and D and D and all of those. All of those have a button on the left-hand side on their menu that says free games. You click on that, you will get thousands of free games. In addition, uh, itch.io is another one. Itch.io, a lot of people are offering up free games, not just RPGs. And then there's pay what you want games, PWYW games out there as well, which fit any budget. They're literally free for the people who can't afford them. And so I do say, yep. if you can afford them, please at least pay something for them. Absolutely. As well, there are uh, copies available for free from uh, for people who are who have needs. Uh, yep. Sometimes you get Kickstarters where uh, for every time who every person who buys a game at this level, another free version is released for people who uh, are in need. Yes. Uh, and another uh, fantastic option out there is going back to Itch.io is uh, Good Causes. Right now, for trans rights in Florida, there is a fantastic bundle for oh, yeah. $5. You get, uh, I, I'm, I'm not even sure of the actual count right now, but it's usually it's in a the lot. hundreds of games. Now, most of these are RPGs. There are some video games in there, uh, but there may be some some sort of simply simplish-ish board games as well. And that's $5 for hundreds of games, and you're donating to a great cause. I will point out a minimum of $5. Yeah. It is a pay what you want. If you wish to support the cause, you can donate any amount. Uh, and it's over 500 games, Jeff is clarifying. Yeah. It's a fan, like Thirsty Sword Lesbians is the big one most people are pushing, but there are a lot of big names in that one. Absolutely. Now, one All right, you thing, have anything else? I was just going to use that, right? do that wrap up. Oh, okay. So one thing we absolutely do not condone or encourage in any way is the pirating of games in any forms. Mm-hmm. Making games takes a lot of work and involves a lot of people, and all of those people deserve to be compensated for that work. 100%. Do not pirate. You wouldn't download a car, would you? Sorry. I didn't mean to make light of it. <laughs> that ad just popped into my head. No, seriously, people deserve to be paid for their work. Absolutely. So that's it for our talk 
on board game budgeting. I hope this segment has been informative and encouraged you to set some form of formal limit on your spending, but also helped you get more games for your buck under that limit. Now we're about to check in with the lobby, but before that, a quick reminder, we are here to answer your gaming and game night questions. You can get questions to us by going to tabletopbellhop.com and clicking on Ask the Bellhop up at the top left of the page. Uh, you can send an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or you can message me on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Welcome to a detailed look at court a modern trick-taking game with a number of different twists. The first game from B5 Productions, who we have to thank for sending us a review copy of this card game. So Court was designed by Christopher Bouthner and features artwork from Sam Hyperwaltz, which somehow is all one word. I have to assume that's some type of branding. It was successfully funded through Kickstarter and started shipping to backers in December of 2022. Publication was done through Christopher's own company, B5 Productions. This is very much a passion product from a new designer using Kickstarter as it was originally Kickstarter as it was originally intended to be used. Now, this trick-taking card game plays three to five players and takes under an hour and gets quicker the more you play and you get to know the cards and the abilities. Uh, the listed age on this is eight plus, which seems about right to me. You can currently get a copy of Court through GameFound where it costs $15, and it should soon be in retail and online stores with an MSRP of $25. And note, that's not a mistake. It was kickstarted through Kickstarter, but the pre-order is on GameFound. Now, the court deck contains only three suits, ranked 1 to 10, and a set of six character cards. Each game, you're going to split the deck evenly, and each player is going to get one of those character cards, or possibly a 10 if you're playing with more players. Standard trick-taking rules here apply, with players having to follow the suit led and the highest card taking the trick. Differences include the lowest card in the trick then activates its power for the player who played it. Then the winner of the trick gets a crown, a little token, and then grabs all the cards and then divides them up among the players. So when they take the trick, they decide who gets what. Those cards then form a tableau in front of the players called their court. At the end of the round, players then add up the values of all their cards in their court. These are your points. Then the court becomes your hand the next round. After three hands, the lowest score wins. Now, of course, there's a bit more to it than that with things like objective cards and the character abilities, but this works as a general overview for the game, so you know what we're talking about. Now, to get a look at the cards, crowns, and other bits you get with court, check out our court unboxing video on YouTube. Now, the card quality here is excellent. You're looking at playing card quality cards. You've got cool little wooden crowns, some pretty clear instructions, and it even includes a scoring sheet and a pencil. While a solid enough Kickstarter passion project, that's not to say it doesn't have its problems. Yeah, the component quality here is good, but there are some graphic design choices which do hinder the game, and there's at least one misprinted card. Now, we'll get into more details of that when sharing our opinion of the game after an overview of play. Start a game of court by pulling all of the character cards from the main deck and selecting one of each suit to use. Shuffle the rest of the deck and deal the cards out evenly between the players and then deal out the character cards. When playing with four or five players, you add in ten cards to the character cards. You only use three of the six provided each game. <laughs> Next, shuffle the objective cards and flip two face up in the center of the table. Place the crowns within easy reach of the players. The start player determined randomly as the lead. Now each trick, one player leads and everyone else has to follow suit. You can't follow suit, you can play off suit. And character cards can be played at any time and trump everything else, including playing off suit even if you have the proper suit. Now, the player who played the highest rank card of the matching suit or the highest character card wins and takes the trick, as well as one crown token. Then you find the lowest played card in that trick. If that card has a power on it, it triggers for the player who played it. Here, though, off-suit cards count as zero, so throwing off-suit is a good chance your card's power will go off. Only odd-numbered cards have powers, and these range from swapping cards in your hand and your court, swapping cards between courts, getting to choose the card you win from a trick even if you didn't win the trick, 
causing a player to discard crowns and stealing a crown from an opponent. Now, character cards count as the lowest card played for this as well. So in general, if you win a trick with a character card, its ability will go off. Mm -hmm. Now, the winner of the trick then divides up all the cards in that trick to the each player. Uh, each card going to a separate player, one card per player. These are then placed face up in front of the players forming their court. When dividing up cards, though, you cannot give yourself a character card. After the trick is done, any player can claim one of the face up objective cards if they qualify for it. They include things like getting three crowns in a row, having a pair in your court, or other things like that. Now, the player who won the trick gets the next lead, and the round continues until everyone's played their full hand. Players then calculate their end of round score by adding up the value of their court with characters being worth zero. You then subtract two points for every crown you've earned. Everyone then returns all of their crowns to the table. Any taken objectives are replaced by new cards, and players pick up their courts, which become their new hand. The player with the most points gets the lead for the next round. You do this for three rounds. At the end of the game, players total their points for every round, subtract points for any objective cards they've claimed, which are worth five, minus five points each, and the player with the lowest points wins, uh, sometimes known as golf scoring. In addition to these rules, you can also play court in teams when you have four players. When playing this way, the team only scores the points for the player with the highest total. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much it for how to play court. Basic trick-taking mechanics with a bunch of other stuff tossed on top. Now, when I learned about court, I knew I had to check it out. As you've surely noticed, if you watched more than one episode of our show or one, or one of our videos, we love trick-taking games here at Tabletop Bellhop. We've reviewed a number of them in the past, most recently Thrones of Valeria from Daily Magic Games. We've also reviewed Macaron, Goris, Maximus, and The Crew, for example. We also love games that do something new and are always on the lookout for unique games. Court, a royally clever card game, fits in with both of these things. Now, of all the trick-taking games we've talked about in the past, this one probably is the most unique with the most new things being added in. It offers up quite a few differences from traditional playing card games. This includes the fact there are only three suits, the way face cards are used, the objective cards, the entire court tableau system, the fact odd cards have powers, and the entire lowest score wins victory condition. This is a lot of changes in one game, mm -hmm. and we think this is going to be the big thing that determines if court is right for you and your group. Now, personally, I like all these additions. As an experienced gamer, I've seen all of these before, just never all together, and never lumped in with a trick-taking card game. I do worry, though, that traditional card game players, or even more so, someone who's not familiar with trick-taking, is going to find all of these overlapping rules to be overwhelming and confusing. Now, I sit on the other side of this for Mo. While I certainly enjoy trick-taking games, this one just didn't quite work for me. Now, I haven't played it as many times, but I admit it just never felt natural for me as one of the things I enjoy about trick-taking games is the ability to chat and relax while playing, mm -hmm. whereas this game required a lot more attention that I was sort of interested in giving. And I can totally see that, and I'm sure you're not the only one. Now, the other problem you get when you combine so many different mechanics is potential game imbalance, and I think this is a bit of a problem in court. There are some character cards that are just better than others, and then others that combo poorly or perhaps too well with certain objective cards if they come up at the same time. For example, there's one Jack character card that has you guessing what cards are in the other player's hands. Well, in this game, after the first hand, you know what's everyone in everyone's hand for the next round. So if you've got this Jack in your court at the end of the round, just make sure to memorize at least one, even better, two cards from each of the other players. Play your Jack in hand one. That's pretty much a free crown from every player, as well as one for winning the trick if your jack goes through. Another example of this is the jack that reverses the rules for the next trick. So the lowest card wins the trick, and the highest card's power triggers. When you combi combo this with the objective that has you taking it for uh, winning a trick with four or lower, you are pretty much guaranteed seven points. Well, minus seven minus points. Minus seven points. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, these interactions make the game feel like, as a whole, it probably could have used a bit more development and playtesting to me. 
at this point, we've actually chosen just not to use those specific cards. So you're still kind of stuck with one of them because they're both jacks. Now, listeners know we're not a huge fan of having to house rule games. So I think this is notable that we've done so for this one. Now, on a similar note, there are some inconsistencies between the cards, the rules, and the various powers. For example, the rules talk about royals. You use your royal to do this, you use your royal to do that, and then later in the same paragraph talks about characters. And it took a couple seconds to realize they're talking about the face cards, which are the same thing. And at least one objective card references your workshop, if you have the following in your workshop. And there's no workshop in this game, so we assume that must be talking about your court. Which again, this makes me think, I wonder if this game had a completely different theme at one point, or if they rethemed it something else and put it back, because it just feels like like Workshop and Royals possibly was a di- in characters might have been different ways to name things. Unfortunately, we also ran into a few ambiguities that weren't clarified by the rules. For example, one objective card is win three crowns in a row. Well, what does win mean? Does it have to be one as part of tricks? What about the Joker card I mentioned earlier where you're guessing crowns and you're getting crowns off other players? Are those winning crowns? Or there's a queen card that just gives you two crowns if you win the trick. Is that winning two crowns or are you just getting two crowns? Now, I will say it's pretty easy for your group to have a short chat and decide how you want to play it when these come up. It would have been nice to find some kind of official clarification here. Interestingly, despite the game already being delivered to a majority of backers, there aren't many questions or comments on Board Game Geek to help players get official answers. Now, this problem ended up being extrapolated when playing in teams of four players. The four player rules are one short paragraph in the rule book with no adjustments to play except for scoring. But then you start playing and questions come up like, hey, wait, can I give my partner a character card? Because the rules say you can't keep a character, but they don't say where you have to give it if you can't keep it. And it really feels like you shouldn't be able to just pass characters back and forth. But rules as written, that's legal. Indeed, passing characters to your partner so you officially obey the can't keep them rule was quite broken, it seemed. As it allowed a team to collect and keep all of the face cards, which made them nearly unbeatable in over three rounds. Yeah. And that's only one example. There were other things that came up when we were playing four players as well in teams. Now, the biggest problem we had with Court above all of this, though, is the graphic design. There are a number of minor issues here that maybe if only one of them was in the box wouldn't bother me, but altogether is pretty significant. For one, they chose the three suit colors to be red, green, and black. And not having color blindness, even I know these are terrible color choices when looking at vision issues, especially for people who have red green color blindness like my dad had. Uh, For people with this issue, I ran this through like a website where you can test it. The red and green suits look to be the exact same yellow. Now, to be fair, each suit does have a different symbol for it, which does make up for the somewhat. But I just wish they'd gone with a more colorblind friendly color. Like there are thousands of colors to pick from. Why did you pick red and green? And the symbols are small as well, which, depending on your visual acuity, might not help differentiate them as much as they could. Next, you have the card text. It is super tiny, both on the game card as well as the included reference card that tells you what all the card abilities are. Now, there's text on every single one of the odd numbers cards, and half the people I played this game with had to either grab their reading glasses or a magnifying glass to be able to read them. This is a case where clear iconography and just a description of what each con means in the rules would have been much better suited than actual words on the cards. This is even worse on the character cards. They use the same small black lettered font, but it's put over a dark gray background and put diagonally across the cards. We actually had one player that could not read these at all due to the lack of contrast. It's certainly an interesting design choice, and one really just not made with clarity in mind, whatever their goal as a, you know, decoration was. Now, with all these problems, I don't want to be too negative here. We were still able to play the game. Uh, There are only, what, five odd cards. It didn't take long to learn what each of the card powers were, so it's not like we're having to read the cards over and over. And the character cards we just gave to the kids who have much better eyesight and let them read off what the powers were at the start of each game, going, here are the three that are in this game so that everyone knows what they do. 
Now, to me, this is part of the problem with the game, as familiarity and repeatability is part of what makes a card game like this so accessible and enjoyable. And having to think about what's going to be different each game just lessened my enjoyment of the experience of playing. Now, we've tried court at all player counts and found that this game worked best at three and honestly worse at uh, the four player team mode. With three, the entire deck is in play. So you have perfect information. No cards are out and everyone has a nice, long, nice, nice, thick hand to be able to play through. And there's just something about there's three suits for three players just feels right. It's not a mechanical thing. It's just a feeling thing when you're playing three suits, three character players. And what I like is that this player count, you have enough cards that you're probably going to have cards from all three suits, which is something that personally, to me, makes trick taking games more fun and interesting where your goal in part of the game is probably going to be to void yourself of a suit. To me, that's a key part of playing trick-taking games, which you didn't really see at the higher player counts, so you didn't have as many cards and often only had two suits in your hand. Right, and while I didn't fall in love with this game, I will definitely agree that three-player is the sweet spot for this game. It, it did definitely feel much more enjoyable at that point. Yep. Now, looking at just the gameplay of the game, ignoring all any production issues or ambiguities. I liked the gameplay here. I liked what they were doing. Now, the best part in this game, the, the really brilliant thing is the court system and the way you split the cards up at the end of a trick. This is a very cool mechanic with surprising depth. When you first hear about it, and probably anyone listening right now is probably thinking, well, you just take all the low cards. That way you get the least points, right? Well, the, by doing that, you end up messing up your next hand because you're going to have to pick up that whole court. Now you're going to have a handful of low cards and you're probably not going to win a lot of tricks the next round. And not winning tricks means not getting crowns and not getting minuses. Plus, not winning tricks doesn't let you divide up the cards to try to get those objectives. So you have to plan around what card powers you have as well. So if you don't mind, you don't mind taking the 10. If you got a one in your hand, you can play later to pick up that 10 to then use to use another trick to give that 10 to someone else. I, it's the whole thing for this game. There is a huge amount of strategy and planning. And honestly, compared to all the other trick takers were played, perhaps even more strategy than any other. And this is where things to sort of, sort of start to overdo it for me. I think if this had been a three suit game with this split card collecting for the next hand Roy, uh, tableau in front of you, this would have been a fantastic game that I would have enjoyed. But then you add in the powers on top of that, and that's where I find it starts getting a little bit too busy for mm. what I was wanting out of the game. Totally fair. So I'm tempted to try a game now without the powers and see how it plays. Now, another thing I want to note, which I did mention in passing before, that is that every player in this game has perfect information as soon as the last card in the first round is played. At that point, you not only have seen every card in play in the game, but exactly what cards, what players are going to have in their next hand, which makes the game extremely tactical and really rewards card counting. Together, this level of strategy and tactics is a mixed blessing. Not everyone who plays card games enjoys counting cards. Some people just want to focus on what's in their hand and play more casually, and that doesn't work well in court. If you can't be bothered to count cards and keep track of what's been played and what hasn't and who has what, you won't do well against another player who is doing this extra work. Now, as for my personal game groups and people I've been playing with this, uh, playing court with, this has had mixed reception. For my youngest daughter, who is not all that young, I don't want to think I'm playing with a young kid here, the multiple mechanics and various card abilities and things you have to think about at once were too much. I'd, like for her, it would be completely unplayable. On the other hand, my oldest daughter loved it, adored it, and wants to play more. She's been asking to play the game more often. Now, my wife, Deanna, didn't love it the first time we played, but grew to enjoy it more the more we played. And in the end, I think feels pretty favorable about the game, though she is the one that had the most issues with the graphic design. And she did not enjoy four player with partners. Now, my trick-taking, loving friends enjoyed the game quite a bit, as did my mother-in-law, who's also a big fan of traditional card games. Personally, I enjoy it. I plan on keeping it in my collection. I'm just not sure it'd be my first choice if someone asked me to sit down and play a card game. But if someone asked to play it, I'm not going to say no. And for me, it, it unfortunately just never landed. Uh, maybe if I continued playing it, I might come around. 
But with the number of trick-taking games out there, I'm not sure I want to learn to love a game when there are many I did love from my first hand. Overall, I dig Court. Feels like a traditional trick-taking card game with a bunch of additional stuff thrown on top. To me, it's got kind of a trick-taking for hobby gamers vibe or like expert level trick-taking game um, with the mechanics. And I, I only wish that this feel was backed up with a hobby card game production value to go with it and graphic design. What I would personally love to see this game is for it to do well enough, enough people to buy it to get a second printing. And then have that second printing improve on the existing problems. Give me a nice clear reference card listing all the card powers, toss in some iconography on the cards, swap to a more colorblind friendly colors and clear up any ambiguities. Because as it is, we enjoyed court, but it could be better. At the very least, some of the ambiguities need to be clarified in an FAQ on Board Game Geek or elsewhere. Uh, one thing I've, I've been thinking, and I actually didn't even put this in the notes, is this game would be fantastic as a trick-taking tournament game. Mm -hmm. For people who really want to take this seriously, uh, you know, in, in, in any sort of tournament situation, this game is great because it really does play well for competitive card players. Yep. I can see that. Now, if you enjoy traditional trick-taking card games, uh, especially games like Spades, you might want to check out Court. This is especially true, though, if you happen to have a group that often ends up being only three players. There are not a lot of trick-taking games out there for three. Yeah, this is definitely a bonus, as many trick-takers are more even player count oriented. Now, if you are a card gamer who loves card counting and playing against opponents who do the same, where the skill is in reading the other players and playing through your hand in the right order and not the luck of the draw, you're going to love court. This card game is a card counter's dream due to the fact that after that first round, everyone has perfect information. My dad was this kind of player, and he would have adored this game, especially if we started playing a penny a point. Now, if you're looking for a more casual trick taker where you can enjoy the conversation with friends and not fixate on the game, this might not be the one for you. Yeah. And if you haven't played a trick taking game before, or at least new to this style of card game, I would say you should probably stay away from court. There are a lot of additional mechanics tossed on top of the whole I lead you follow mechanics found in a trick taker, and I think it'll be overwhelming. Personally, I'm looking forward to trying this game out with more people, perhaps bringing it out to a public play event, uh, and hopefully catching some traditional card game players who haven't really experienced modern trick taking games just to see what their th thoughts are. Well, that's it for our review of Court a trick-taking card game, and a lot more. Perhaps a, too, a bit too much for traditional playing card players, but lots to munch on if you like crunch and card counting. We're always on the lookout for new trick-taking games to try. Do you know of one we haven't played yet and should check out? Let us know about it in the comments below. Also, be sure to like, subscribe, follow, ding the bell, thumbs up, or do whatever, wherever you are, has you do to show you enjoyed this review. After that, I invite you to check out my written review of Court over on the blog where I was able to get into more depth than we shared here. That's at tabletopbellhop.com. Join us as we check out The Quest Pyramid, a wooden puzzle box from Escape Welt, who we have to thank for sending us a package of puzzles to check out. Don't worry, we won't spoil anything for you, though we do have one tip. So we first discovered Escape Welt's escape boxes during the holidays of 2022. Escape Welt started off as an escape room company that shifted to being a wooden puzzle company during the pandemic and now ships their puzzles all over the world. These puzzles are laser-cut birch wood and include traditional flat puzzles, as well as what they call 3D puzzle games, which include these escape boxes. They consider puzzles like the Quest Pyramid to be room escape puzzles, where instead of trying to solve puzzles to break out of a room, you're instead trying to solve puzzles to break into the box. Now, when you open the box for one of these puzzles, you're presented with a chunky, solid 3D shape and no guidance. It's up to you to figure out what to do next. Check out our Quest Pyramid unboxing video on YouTube to see exactly what this particular puzzle looks like right out of the box. 
Now, once you solve the puzzle, you get a small reward and you end up with a physical artifact that looks great on a shelf or makes a good conversation piece. Even better, though, you can also use it as a gift box and double the fun by hiding a gift inside and giving it to someone else. That way, they not only get a gift from you, but also a cool puzzle they have to solve first. While that's true for all of Escape Welt's escape boxes, let's talk about the Quest Pyramid in particular. So the Quest Pyramid is the chunkiest wooden puzzle I've personally played around with. It's a surprisingly heavy, dense box that is pleasing to hold. It felt significantly less fragile than other similar puzzles, and I had very little worry about breaking anything while I was trying to solve it. Definitely chunky. I remember the first time you sort of reached out and, and handed it to me. Yes. Uh, the weight was shocking because, again, this is only birch wood. Uh, though to me, to me, there were still some bits and pieces of it. I felt a little nervous if I should push, pull, twist harder or not. Now, one of the best parts about this particular puzzle that it presents not only a very clear starting point, but basically gives you a set of step-by-step -step instructions on how to solve it right on the puzzle. Now, I don't mean it gives you the solution. It doesn't tell you step-by-step -step what to do, but at least gives you hints on what to look for first and what you should do after that, and so on. This was a huge bonus, though I will say it was easy to do certain things out of order, mm. which could lead to some confusion. I think people who are more used to these puzzles might hold off on solving things they know they can until they work out the order of steps first. Now, the quest pyramid has four main steps to it, with some being more intuitive than others. I appreciated the fact that the first step, step one, was very clear, which was good because it let you accomplish something quickly after picking up the puzzle. It's a nice reward, an instant, oh, there, I've, I already feel smart, I've done something. This stops you from getting frustrated before you've even really begun to explore. And there is a lot here you could get frustrated with, so it's quite a welcome feature. Now, later steps aren't quite so simple and just challenging enough to me. Oshan and I were working on this puzzle together, and while I figured out the first step, he was the one that noticed a key clue I had missed for solving the second one. It's interesting that you might expect a physical puzzle like this to be all physical solutions, but sometimes it's about how you look at things and not how about how you pull, push, or twist. Yes. Now, while trying to get the quest pyramid open, I will say we got stuck. We got stuck more than once a few times, but it's not a bad thing. You want to get stuck doing these. You don't want them to be so easy that you sit down and the first time you play with it, you get it open. Our copy of the puzzle sat on my game table and then later on my desk for about a week, ended up on the dining room table for a little while, and basically got played with by various members of the family throughout a week. Then, just the other day, I had an epiphany about part of the puzzle. I wasn't even playing with the puzzle. I was doing something else, and I'm like, wait a minute, I think I have an idea. I went back and was able to finish it off in a matter of minutes. Now, while I did eventually figure out the part we were stuck on, I felt smart, and I really loved, actually, the fourth part of the puzzle, which I'm not going to spoil here. This is a real key to their ex expected completion times. I think they are realistic, but not in the same way as a board game where you sit mm. down for an hour and finish it. More that the total time is going to be oh, about an hour, but that time may be broken up over much longer periods as you think about things between uh, the time on hand. And for this particular box, there was no time where I required any outside help, nor did I have to brute force anything or pick any locks. Every aspect of the puzzle I was able to solve by following the clues on the box itself in a logical manner. That being said, for those who do need help, it is available on the website. Mm -hmm. This is especially nice if you want to put a gift inside, but not fight to solve it yourself to do so. Though I want to mention, uh, I saw a uh, question on Amazon suggesting that there was a quick way to open it, uh, a cheat so if you would, to open it, to put a gift inside, and this is not the case for this puzzle. No. You, the only way to get through it is to solve all of the steps. Uh, there is no hidden secret door for putting gifts in. Yeah, I, I think it's mainly a translation issue for, because Escape Wealth is a German company. The trick is you go online and they show you how to open it and solve it. 
which one of the things that has shocked me about all of these is how quickly you can open them once you know the answer. And it is minutes, uh, if that. <laughs> yeah, kind of like speed Rubik's Cube. You can get some of these open very quickly. Uh, now, I will say that I did have a minor problem with this box. Um, there is a final prize and a small piece of wood chip off that um, after assembling it and then trying to take it apart to put back in the box. So there was a minor thing. Uh, it was pretty easily fixed with some white glue, um, which seems to have stuck perfectly fine. But I did want to call it out. This was a puzzle, a problem with the prize, not the actual physical box. Birch is not the strongest of woods. Now, one final thing for those who do manage to solve the puzzle, a little bit of a pro tip here, is once you get it open, just be careful when closing it back up. Make sure everything lines up and watch the knot. If you do put it on wrong, you can still reopen it, but you're going to have to account for the fact you assembled it wrong to be able to get it open in the new configuration. Some reviewers have stated that you can't put it back together, which is just wrong. Yeah. It requires you to be very careful, but you can absolutely put it back together. Yeah, in this case, for those reviews, this is pure user error. Nothing wrong with the box or the production of it. It's actually clear the way things should go back if you're paying attention. And I even think that the designers of this did a bit of a pokey yoke here, but it's just not enough for some people. If you force it, it might get stuck. So who do you think should be looking at picking up a copy of Quest Pyramid? So of all the puzzles we've tried for Escape Well, this one has bumped up to my favorite. Um, Escape Well, when they reached out to me, said that this was their easiest puzzle to solve. And I got to agree that it was the easiest, but I wouldn't call it easy. That said, we are still pretty new at this type of puzzle experience, this type of game experience. Really, I had not done one of these um, except for my dad having a wooden puzzle box he hid his money, his American money in when I was a kid. These type of puzzle boxes are a new experience to me. I have a feeling someone who plays a lot of these kind of puzzles would not find this much of a challenge. Like they're going to look at the clues in the back and know pretty much what they have to do. But for me, my family and my friends, I found the difficulty to be pretty much perfect. It's a fantastic starting point for this sort of puzzle and great for all appropriate ages as a result. Now, unlike the Fort Knox box and the House of the Dragon, these are other Escape Vault boxes reviewed in the past, I didn't feel the need to look up anything online or watch any videos. Now, in particular, the Fort Knox box, I got stuck because there was a piece that moved that I didn't realize should move, and I found that out through a video. Whereas the House of the Dragon, we solved without having to look up any clues, but we solved it by basically picking the lock, by, by brute forcing one of the solutions. So I went to look up online to figure out how we were supposed to get the answer which was actually kind of interesting new. Now, this one, we solved the puzzle without any outside help, other than the fact we teamed up and compared notes, and we did everything in a logical order. Nothing was, you know, tried every possible combination. I got to say that felt really good. And the teaming up wasn't required. It just shaved a bit of time off that final solving time. And it's the thing we mentioned before on the show before. Sometimes just another set of eyes and another, another look, fresh set of eyes makes a big difference. Now, what I honestly like most about the three boxes I played with is they make fantastic gift boxes when they're done. And I got to appreciate the pyramid has a slightly larger space than the other two puzzles. And I got to say the actual final prize was also neater than what were in the other two boxes. Though I must say you cannot fit a gift card into this puzzle box. No, you cannot. Despite what you might see on the Escape Well website. You can, but you're not closing that box. <laughs> Unless you like your gift cards folded in half, I suppose. Yes. Uh, we did admittedly find some of the other prizes in these games quite disappointing. But I expect most people aren't doing these for the gift, but merely for the satisfaction of completing it. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of like Cracker Jacks in that way, if you think of it. The enjoyment is eating the Cracker Jacks. The prize is just a little bonus. People enjoy eating Cracker Jacks. Oh, I like Cracker Jacks. <laughs> Just like pink popcorn. Same reason. Now, overall, I think the Quest Pyramid from Escape Well is the perfect entry-level wooden puzzle box. It's a great-looking physical object. It's easy to manipulate in most cases. Has a very clear set of clues that get you started solving right away. Overall, the difficulty is low without being too easy, just hard enough to make you feel smart 
when you finally figure out the solution and probably taking you more than one sitting, which honestly gives you more game for your buck. If you're puzzle box curious or know someone who is, this seems like a great purchase to me. If you're like us and just discovering this genre of game, this will also be a good choice. It was a refreshing change after trying some of the more difficult boxes, including one that we've been stuck on for quite some time, though I did finally make the next step on that one just yesterday. I think the chunky nature of it is a big benefit over some of the others as well, since you don't have that same hesitancy about breaking it that some of the other puzzles really personally gave me when I got my hands on them. Yeah, I can totally agree with that. I also think this is a good place to try out the genre. If, if like us, a year ago, you'd never played around with these wooden birch laser cut puzzles, um, you you don't know what you're missing. Like, if you've never held a good wooden puzzle box in your hand, it, you don't know it. I, like, once you touch one of these, you can't help but start pulling, pushing, sliding, tugging, flipping, reading, looking for hints. Um, for a great example of my first experience, check out my unboxing video for House of the Dragon. That was the first one I opened. And I had a really hard time to not just fiddle with that on live stream. It really is something you can leave on a table and it will be irresistible to just about anyone. Now, where I'm not sure on this one is for fans of wooden puzzle boxes. There are a number of you out there. I've seen you on YouTube now that I've started deep diving this particular style of game. I don't know if this one's going to challenge an experienced wooden puzzle box fan. I think this might be a little too simple. But even if you are an experienced player, maybe this is the one you pick up to give to other people to get them hooked on your hobby. It's the one you have sitting out for guests to lure them into your hobby. Now, for any of the above, if you do decide to pick up one of these puzzles direct from Escape Vault, remember, you can save 10% if you use our special discount code, BELLHOP, one word, B-E-L-L-H-O-P. That's it for our review of the Quest Pyramid Wooden Puzzle Box from Escape Welt. So far, the most approachable escape box we've gotten to play with yet. Do you enjoy these kinds of puzzles? What's your favorite? Tell us about it in the comments below. And for those of you catching this episode as soon as it goes live, I also encourage you to go to tabletopbellhop.com and check out our 200th episode giveaway, where we're giving away not this box, but another box from Escape Welt the Fort Knox box. I also invite you to check out my written review of the Quest Pyramid over on the blog as well, which I will keep spoiler free. And now the Bellhops Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. We got to start inserting another coffee break in there somewhere, <laughs> or at least a drink water. If we do two reviews, I think we need a lobby check in, even if no one's saying anything, <laughs> just to like, I get that. I'm like, my voice is dying. Right. Throwing that in there. Sausage making. Also, hi, Chad. How's it going? <laughs> All right. So games we played since last episode. Let us start off with the surprise game night that, that I, I, I do not celebrate the same holidays as all of my friends. And I totally forgot about it. So Tori and Kat came over last Friday and they made a big deal about how, yeah, we can actually come because um, um, one of their parents has COVID. Yes. Another reminder, the pandemic's not over. We went through it ourselves just a month ago, missed five weeks of work because of it. It was kind of terrible. Um, so, so they're like, oh yeah, we can actually make it. And I'm like, okay, cool. Dad's got COVID. That part sucks, but it's cool. You can make it. So then they show up and they take multiple trips down my stairs, bringing things in. They're dressed all in green. Um, Pat's got a like, yes, I'm really Irish shirt on. Tori's wearing something else green. Pat brought in a mug that she bought in Ireland and Tori brought in beer. And I'm like, what? Oh, it's St. Patrick's. And then I remember that, yes, uh, Kat's family is is Irish and Kat's dad, who has COVID, should be serving the corned beef right now. And, and I'm not joking. They 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 go all out. Corned beef, cabbage, potatoes every year. Big family deal for them. I Obviously, it was a holiday to them. And I was like, it's Friday night. Yay. <laughs> Yeah, I, I often forget uh, we made the mistake one year of being at Breakout Con and deciding to go out for uh, drinks and walk into an Irish pub on St. Patty's Day, yeah. which was uh, 
you know, we, we luckily missed the rush, but did have to put up with the uh, live music, live music and vast amounts of strange decorations everywhere. Yes. So if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be here talking now because that was the night we decided to do a podcast. It was. So I guess it was fortuitous. <laughs> uh, so added to this, they even brought games. <laughs> One specifically a game they play once a year on St. Paddock's, which is Corrigan's from Matago. Uh, this is a game I know of because I have shared deals on this game many times. And in my head, it was this little small box game. Now, this was a big box game. Um, super cute. It's 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 uh, looks kind of childish, but you've got this this multicolored board. You've got these little Corrigan, which is an, another name. It's, it's not a name for Leprechaun, but like fairies or fey folk. You've got Corrigan miniatures and two different co- uh, two different sculpts. Sorry, 10 different sculpts total. Two of them for each of the five players, a like pre-painted pot of gold and big color for board. And we're like, oh, this looks great. Well, it ends up that neither Kat or Tori remember how to play because they play this on St. Patrick's with Kat's family. And every year they need to relearn it. So I stepped up to the plate. I'm the game teacher in the thing, and I, I can read rules pretty quick. So I actually sat there and read the rules. And then we played through Corrigan's. So now Corrigan in Breton means small dwarf and is related to the Cornish word Coric, which means gnome. There you go. So I knew it wasn't leprechaun because there's leprechauns in the game. Whereas if, if there weren't, I would have assumed it meant leprechaun. So I got to say that this game does look like a kid's game. Corey and Kat were even thinking of it as a kid's game, mainly in the, well, we played it when we're drinking, so it can't be that hard, right? <laughs> but it's not. And I'm kind of surprised that they were able to play it. Maybe they didn't play it very well, but this is actually a a pretty solid, I, I'd say, family weight or as we've been calling them, welcoming game, like like something that that new players can enjoy. But it definitely wasn't like a light kids game. Uh, what you have is you've got a board with a city in the middle covered in different colored fields, and all these fields are divided by the fields beside them different ways. And then each field has a bunch of clover tokens in it. You got two fairies, you put them on the board, you look at the clovers that are in the spark you started in, and choose one to keep, and you put it behind a screen. Then, once everyone's got their starting characters on the board, you've got two tokens, you then, on your turn, move one Corrigan. The way you move, though, is you collect animal companions. So some of those clovers are animal companions, others are gold. Now, gold you want to win the game, but animal companions help you move around. And it's really neat because, like, the rabbit let you hop over bushes so you can go over a bush the squirrel for whatever reason goes through doors so it lets you go through a door the mouse lets you go across a bridge the frog lets you go along the river and i think there was a bird that lets you fly to the same colored field anywhere else on the board and it was neat because once you revealed that animal everyone now knew you had it so they knew what one of your tokens are but you could just use that same animal over and over so you're trying to kind of hide what you've got and how much gold you have and stuff it was really neat now yeah, at the start of it, it, what's interesting is the uh the the painted miniatures on board game geek are really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> now each round you're going to draw a colored chip and they're in the the seven colors of the rainbow and of course when the rainbow shows up you know what happens it's an Irish themed game the pot of gold shows up. Now you have a rush to the end. You are trying to get both your corrigans to the pot of gold. And if you don't you get a point penalty or if you get there you get a point bonus however you want to look at it. And here it's neat because now you reveal all your animals and you have to use them in order to get there. And you just have one turn to do it. So like you're trying to plan it. So like, I know I have a bird and a mouse, so I'm two away from this one, but my other Corrigan is going to need a rabbit. So you're trying to hide the fact you have the rabbit because even the person who places the gold is going to try to play. It It was just neat. It it was, it was rather solid. It it was actually a good game. It was simple to learn. Um, I, I got to admit, it would be a good gr- drinking game. It is a good social game, as Sean says. It's a game where you can talk and socialize while you're playing. It's not that that heavy. Um, it's got great components, like like really nice components. Um, there's even promos where there are an additional, I think it's an orange Corrigan, and you can get it in 10 collectible sculpts to go with our, our acquisition disorder we were talking about earlier in the show. If you want to collect them all, there are 10 promo Corrigans out there. I, I just, they showed up thinking, ah, it's a kid's game. And I'm like, no, this isn't a kid's game. This is solid. I got to say, if you do themed game nights, like if this is your thing, if you do a Halloween game night and you do a, 
uh, at St. Patty's game night or whatever. You got to pick this up. Like I, I am glad they have a copy, except I'm sure every other year they'll be celebrating with their <laughs> parents. So we won't be able to borrow it. But I'm like, I would totally bring this out to any in mid March game event. You bring out Corrigan's. Yeah, absolutely. This was uh this was this was a shocker to to hear about. It's only a one five six weight. Uh, but considering that, uh, you know, a six point three on board game geek for a game that's, that's not that bad. light is yeah. not bad at all. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, it wasn't great. I'm not saying rush out, buy Corrigan's, <laughs> it's amazing, everyone should own it, but like for what it is, it was good. Yeah. All right, next game we played was not Irish, but about beer, which fit the night. And that is the Belgian beers race. Um, this is from Grand Gamers Guild, who has to thank for a review copy. Um, one game we are going to review. The problem is I need to get it played more often. This one just hasn't come out. This is only our second play of the game. Um, of course, our first play, one of the Bellhop's rules is we played Extreme. We played Extreme so much that I don't even know if I want to count that first play as counting as playing the game. Because we messed up the timeline rules. So in every other timeline rule game I played, and I know Sean's played at least Takedo, the person in last place takes a move. Now they're no longer in last place, so the new person in last place takes a move. That's not how it works in this game. In this game, the person in last place is active and continues to take moves until they're in first. And that is totally different from every other timeline game I played and really changes the game. Yeah, that's a that's a huge difference. Yes, uh, for people who are used to you know who are hobby gamers and yep. get used to a certain mechanic just working in a certain way, and that's exactly what happened. I read the rules for for because it's literally called the timeline. I read the rules for the timeline. Yeah, yeah, it's a timeline game. I played Francis Drake. I played uh, Glenn Moore. I played uh, Shipyards. Like I, I like this mechanic. I, I played Takedo. So like there there's four other really good games that use this mechanic. So yeah, we messed that up. So I got to say, I, again, playing by the proper rules made the game better. <laughs> this is that's going to be like a bellhop. If no one else has claimed that rule, we got to claim that as like bellhop's law number three. Playing the game by the proper rules makes it better. Who knew? <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was better. Biggest thing is you just had better flow and you could plan out like more moves in a row. And it made the game faster. You did a bunch of things in a row and it felt good. As opposed to, I go to do a thing. Now you do your thing. You do your thing. Okay, I go to do a thing. And in that game, it was like, do a thing. It's like, oh, I got to the brewery. I got to wait now. Okay, I taste a beer. Okay, I got to wait now. Okay, now I'm going to go shopping and get beer to go. Okay, now I got to wait. Okay, now I'm going to try to hitchhike over there. Oh, no one picked me up. Whereas now it's like, all right, I'm going to go to this brewery. I, I'm going to ride my bike. Okay, I got there. I taste a beer. Then other people do a bunch of things. They're like, okay, I'm going to get some to go. Then I'm going to bribe the guy so that I can get a ride to get over to this brewery. I'm going to collect the collectible glass because no one's been here before. And do I have time units? Yes. Okay, I'm going to buy some cheese. Like you just did more and it just felt better. And I've got to say for a game that you can play while drinking, you didn't, the old way you tend to forget what you were doing. And you forget things like, wait, did I buy a beer here yet? Because there's a rule. You can't buy beer at the same brewery twice. Well, you can, but like, it's not worth anything because this is all about tasting beers. Why would you buy the same beer twice? So big improvement. Play by the proper rules. Next up, we noticed a rule we missed. Now, we didn't play extreme, but we didn't use it. And that's that thing I talked about where bribing. You can pay beers out of your backpack to improve your odds of getting picked up when hitchhiking. Man, did that make a huge difference. I think that made more of a difference to the game than the timeline rule because it was so much easier to get around and we explored a lot more of the board. So that was a nice, don't miss that rule. It's just one little line in the middle of all the different rules in that game for how you move. That when hitchhiking, you can pay. And what it is, is for every time unit the hitchhiking would take, you have to pay two beers. And if you pay it, then you just, you get picked up for free. You don't have to roll the dice. That's nice. So that was that was a good and it made sense. Again, the thematic stuff in this is cute, right? Like, well, I, I, bribing the driver when you're hitchhiking does sound a little off. We're going to assume they drink it later and, and not while you're on the trip, um, even though this game does encourage you to drink while you're on the bus. So I guess that's a Belgian thing. I, overall, we're digging this game. Um, Kat and Tori now have a uh, like declared. No, we like this. This is a good game. Like, like we want to play more. Um, Corey in particular really enjoyed it. But what was interesting, and this kind of goes to what we were talking about earlier again, they're like, I don't want to buy it. I don't need a copy of this game. 
I enjoy the game. I like the game. Tori in particular likes playing the game over beers, which fits, but he can do that with me. He's like, I'm not going to do this with anyone else. So why would I go buy the game? This isn't a game we're going to bring to Papa Dome's and, and, and do whiskey shots while we play. Cause that's what we do when we go to Papa Dome's or cats. Like, I'm not going to bring this out with my mom and dad. They, they'll be like, well, I don't care about craft beer in Belgium. Why, why, why are we moving around? To, like, why don't we pull out a Zool or something fun? Right. Whereas they're like, we dig it, but totally not going to buy it. Totally fair. Um, this one, um, we do need a few more plays before a fi- formal review, but it is looking better with each play. Uh, the big one is I want Sean to try it. So when we review it, he can talk about the Belgian beer race. Absolutely. I may not be a big beer drinker, but uh, you don't need to actually physically drink the beers no. to enjoy the game. Totally true. So I might have to break out a Trappist beer the next time we're playing because I do have one cellar. <laughs> Uh, next was multiple plays of court over different nights. Uh, we already talked about this, I think, a lot during a review. Uh, trade four player. I tried three player over at Mims. Um, we tried pairs last night. Um, everyone um, would rather play Thrones of Valeria. That that was kind of the final answer. Um, Gwen really likes it. Like Gwen is like, yeah, I like this. Let's play it again. And I do enjoy it. I like the game, but I don't know how often I'm going to choose it over another trick taker. Yeah, I, I think the team's play really failed. Uh, yeah. I would play it if someone asked me to play, but I would never ask to play it. Yeah, totally fair. Again, I'm probably going to bring it out to some public play events just to see how it goes over. And I'll probably keep the copy on hand because we do enjoy trick and games. And I can see like, I don't know, six months from now going, hey, what was the game with the court where you passed out the cards and, and bringing that out again? Uh, next is multiple plays of Disney Sorcerer's Arena. Um, D played the the four chapter game like with all the rules. Really liked it. Um, her particular quote was, "Now it feels like a real game," <laughs> which was kind of funny. Uh, she was surprised by how much she enjoyed just playing two player. We did that on a date night. Um, she's interested in playing more, and I was just surprised because this is not her style of game. Right. And I, I finally played it at, cha- at chapter four as well. Uh, and and I wasn't surprised that I enjoyed it at that level. I think that was, you know, it, it has finally become a full game. Mm. Uh, you're not missing out on, you know, little little bits. Um, and I, I, you know, it was a it was a solid game. It was pretty much what I expected. At... Once we broke up the full rule, and now I, I gotta say, I still think the game chapter two is still gonna be great for playing with kids. Now, next, we tried Turning the Tide. That is the first expansion of Disney Sorcerer's Arena. Um, It's gotten two plays in our house now. First time I tried it, I just took all three of the new characters and because I wanted to see what they did. Um, Of the three new characters, I didn't like Davy Jones much. Uh, All about curses. Um, Probably work well with other characters who curse, like Dr. Facilier. Um, I don't know. I, I wasn't a huge fan of him. Uh, Though Gwen and Sean actually played a game together last night using the full rules. Uh, We used the core box with the expansion and let them draft. And Sean ended up taking two of the three new characters. Yeah, I I actually really liked Davey. uh, And playing an all-oceanic team had some really interesting interactions that I enjoyed. Yeah, I liked, uh, of the new ones, I really enjoyed Moana. I I liked the new water tiles. I liked the new quickly get around the board thing. And the way it combos so well with the other Oceanic characters. And I also like the way she seemed to be about moving a lot, then hitting people, which was very different than how the other damage dealers in the game seemed to work. Yeah, planning in advance for long movement paths became really rewarding when you combine Moana and the Oceanic tiles. Now, Sean didn't get to try Stitch, but I did. And after one play with them, it's my new favorite. Well, not my new favorite, my favorite of the three. Uh, What I liked about Stitch is he's kind of random. Many of the abilities were based on where his health was, either even or odd. He does some pretty good damage, but is actually also a great tank. And I found he comboed really well with Davy Jones because he has a toughness ability. And if you can get that out, that negates Davy's curses while still leaving Stitch cursed. So Davy can still get all the benefits of having cursed characters. Right. And one of the interesting things I found with Davey is that while he upgrades, as we've talked about in the review, uh, he unupgrades whenever you use his ability. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so you need to uh, work on your 
plan on your discard and plan your discards in order to flip him back and forth, essentially mm -hmm. to to get off that powerful action he has when he is upgraded. Which honestly is a bit of a correction for our review, um, because I hadn't noticed that other characters do have this. I noted that when you upgrade a character, you get a permanent new ability. It ends up that's not true because some of them like you get a new ability, but then you can flip them back over. Uh, Demona is an example of a character from the core set that has that. And it was just a fact of we didn't play those characters with the full rules yet. So kind of missed that that was an option. I, not enough, I think, to like publish a correction, but I did want to call it out. Right. Overall, turning the tide. Cool. I, I like it. New options, which is always good. Three new characters. What I really like is the fact there's a little bit of overlap there. The fact that Moana can put out a, a, a terrain tile that can make Ariel better. So it's it's a way that this new set does improve one of the other players, which is kind of cool from the core set. I like that aspect. Yeah, and again, as we said in our review, this is just a solid, accessible skirmisher that has so far been getting better with its expansions. Yeah, I, at this point, I just need a few more plays. We'll probably do up a review possibly as early as next week, maybe a little bit after. Well, that's it for what we've been playing. Now let's have a look at what we have coming up next. Uh, so last night after our game night with Sean, after he was over, um, after the two of us finally made progression on the space box from Escape Well, which is considered their most difficult box, um, I managed to actually go on to finish the whole thing. So that's actually now ready to be reviewed. Uh, we may cover this one next week, or I might hold off just so we're not talking about Escape Well puzzle boxes two weeks in a row. But that one's pretty much good to go at this point. Um, I don't know if my kids will ever figure that one out. But I, I, it, by Wednesday, it'll be interesting to see if anyone else can figure this one out. It, it definitely had some some twists. And man, for knowing what to do first was terrible. <laughs> yeah, it was interesting. This puzzle stood out in that it was one where things happened accidentally yes. based on configurations. Uh, which is not something that you would ever have happen in, for instance, the the pyramid that we reviewed today. Right. Yeah, there was we I, we accidentally solved sections of the puzzle without trying, and like we're fiddling with it, and suddenly something popped out. And we're like, "What the heck did we do to get that to work?" Yeah. So yeah, it's an interesting that that's an interesting aspect of this puzzle compared to one that is arguably easier. Mm -hmm. um whereas the things just kind of get solved if you play with this one <laughs> the, the fun part with this one was there was an aspect of it i was certain was happening and sean was certain was not and it ended up i was right and um I, if you google it you'll be able to find it i don't know if that's considered a spoiler or not I, that is the other thing with the i gotta decide what i'm willing to share and not willing to share on this particular puzzle it's a tough one uh there was a okay. lot of different uh you know whether debating whether or not we should try lock picking versus yep. trying to solve it was it, an interesting uh selection of issues yeah and there was a lot of stuff we were doing that was completely totally wrong but seemed to be working yep which was kind of surprising um now another thing i have there's a copy can i reach a copy in here i don't know if i can reach it around here i have copies of downforce and i'm saying copies because i picked up one for myself but i picked up a bonus copy and i need to get this played before april because we are going to do something new at the next barbershop bar event uh for those of you here in windsor or possibly in the local area to make it worth driving into windsor and that is have a play to win table we're going to have a copy of Downforce out. I'll teach you the game, and everyone who plays will enter to win a chance to bring that copy home. I have greatly enjoyed Play to Win myself, and it'll be cool doing an event like that ourselves. But the thing is, to do this, it'll help if I know how to play the game. And so one of my goals for next week is to at least uh, learn to play Downforce. I may or may not do an unboxing for this one. This one's not obligation. Purchase the games out of our own pocket. So I, I don't know if we're going to do an unboxing or not. Yeah, play to win is a fantastic uh, thing that we first ran into or I first ran into at Queen City Con uh, where they had a large number of uh, aspects out that we could uh, play and uh, play and win. And I, that's how we, we got our copy of Networks from. Yeah, Networks and um, there was something else. We had two we brought home, didn't we? Yeah, I, I got Networks that gave to you guys and I forget what D. 
yeah Maybe there one. was two two games we brought home but it was just fun playing games to try to win them like there was there was the content that the um the the contest um so roger in the chat's asking if we got it in essex no we paid significantly less than that which is why we were able to purchase multiple copies i am not willing to give away my source on that <laughs> sorry <laughs> local gamers because we may go back and pick up additional copies uh at the price we paid they're worth like giving away and and i'm not saying it's a cheap game this is restoration games this is one of their most popular games this is a classic 80s game rethemed rebuilt with fantastic components supposedly real good i have no idea why we're able to find them so cheap there we go now i do think as we kind of called out in the feedback section we do kind of owe it to daily magic games to play shadow kingdoms of valeria with the rise of titans expansion we've had that for quite some time sitting here again there was a reason you couldn't get it for a long time but now that you can we really should get to that one i think we're going to bump that one up the obligation pile to at least be able to talk about even if we don't get a review out right away and with that another daily magic game we reviewed two of the small box games but we haven't started on the third which is Siege of Valeria. Plus, I've got an expansion for Dice Kingdoms of Valeria, which I did try to play on Friday night, but Sean had my copy, so Unfor we didn't get to play it. Unfortunately, I had the uh, I had I had the uh, the the uh, public games boxes in my uh, possession, and uh, in in that was the Dice Kingdoms yep. box. Uh, then there's Disney Sorcerer's Arena. I want to play some more Turning the Tide, and then maybe I want to open up the next expansion and play some more of that. And then if I get through that, maybe I'll open the other expansion. But really, the focus will be to play around more with the Turning the Tide expansion to see how it affects the games, and then get up a review of that one. Yeah, and I'm looking to play uh, now that I've now that I've played with two out of the three Turning the Tides. Uh, I'm interested in in seeing how that how to play against some of those yeah. turning the tide expansion uh players uh but also i want to see the other expansions myself <laughs> yeah we're gonna do one at a time i'm not gonna toss it all into the pot yeah. we'll do them one at a time uh finally uh friday we should be gaming together i think everyone's torian cat are free i think sean's in town this weekend yep so i am hoping to let sean try the belgian beer race uh along with torian cat so that way you can get your thoughts out before we do a review which all of that together is probably way more than we fit in one week, but we'll see if we can try. <laughs> Fair enough. This show wouldn't be possible without our Patreon patrons, our VIP guests. So here's a quick shout out to five of them. Brian Van Beek. Thank you, Brian. Diane Tuzano. Thanks, Ma. The Misdirected Mark Podcast. Thank you, friends from Buffalo. Lucas, thank you. Evil John, thank you, John. Well, that was the double bell. That means our shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the lobby doors. Though the doors are closed, you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com, all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, and on your podcatcher of choice as the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast in the correct order now. <laughs> How was our service tonight? If you appreciate what we do, be sure to tip your bellhop over at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. Also, wherever you happen to be listening, viewing, or watching this, it'd be awesome if you did the whole show your appreciation with a like, thumbs, retweet, or whatever you can do to show your support. That's all for us tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us live, and I hope to see you back next week. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.